Um, hello, everyone. Um, I hope this is working. Uh, I'm not totally sure because I've not used this before, but we'll give it a go. Um, welcome to um, this afternoon's webinar, which is all about uh, the essentials to setting up a freelance career. And um, what we're going to try to go through is to go through the five uh, key things to think about if you're thinking about going freelance, um, just so uh, you can yeah, set yourself up for success. Now, give me one second. I'm just going to make sure that this is working properly. Give me two seconds. It's all a learning experience. Um, let's see if I can make this full screen. Okay. Okay, maybe I can see this. Hopefully that works for everybody. Um, so, I think that's right. Okay. Um, Lorna, can you see? If Lorna tells me that she can see, then I'll know that everything is fine. But I think that's probably fine. Um, I don't actually know how she would let me know. That's quite funny. Um, okay, so I'm just going to get started. So um, we're going to go through the five things that people should think about when they are thinking about setting up a freelance career. Um, why are we doing that? The world is really changing when it comes to freelancers. So uh, the world is changing every single day and every moment something new comes up. I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of trepidation about um, about going freelance, potentially if you are a freelancer at the moment, you're feeling nervous, um, which I totally understand. And I'm really hoping that five o'clock today, the government is going to announce some support for freelancers because I feel like they're the ones, in addition to small businesses, who have been left out the most. But when this all passes, um, there are more and more people who are going into a freelance career and and they think that about 50% of the work the workplace and the workforce are going to be freelancers um, by 2020. So it is changing quite a lot. Um, so I want to go through the five things that I want you guys to think about. If you are thinking about going freelance and you're not working as a freelancer yet um, and you're still working in a full-time job, these are the things that I think you should consider. Um, so the first one is about preparing to take the leap. So if you are currently in full-time employment, there are a few things that you should think about before you before you um, decide to go freelance. So the first one is about getting your personal finances in order. The second is setting yourself up well so that um, you have everything prepared before you leave your job. And then the third thing is actually getting started before you leave so that you've got a few things under your belt that you can use that you can point to. So I'm going to go to each of these in a bit more detail. So the first one, um, by the way, we'll send out all these slides, so don't worry about it if you're not able to keep up. There's a lot of text um, on here. But the first thing is about getting your personal finance in order, in order. And I say personal finances, they are personal, so what looks good for me is not gonna look the same as what good looks like for you. Um, but being really conscious about where you are, because when you go freelance, obviously, you don't have the consistent income necessarily every single month. So getting really, really clear and getting on top of those things is going to be even more important. Um, so it's getting clear on where you are. And um, I think a really important thing to do if you're currently in work is to set a goal for yourself. So what would be a comfortable buffer for you? So for me, um, I would like to have six months worth of expenses in a bank account in order for me to feel comfortable to do something radically different. And now it might look different for somebody else. That doesn't mean all the bells and whistles, six months worth of money. It's just to pay my rent, to pay my basic bills so that I know that in, in the worst case scenario, I've got a six month runway. So thinking about how much do you need uh, by what date, how many months away of that, and therefore how much you need to save or earn in order to get there. Um, once you've done that, it's doing an audit of where you are. How much money is coming into your account? How much is leaving? What are you spending it on? Um, when you are trying to save money, you you have two levers. You can either save money or you can um, earn more money. And it's looking at how can you do both. So looking at what you're currently spending, 
um, what's not really adding that much value to your life or isn't aligned with your values and what, spe what are you spending money on that's actually less important than your goal of, of going freelance. Um, we all probably have a little bit of room in our spending that we can cut, particularly I guess at the moment if we're all stuck at home, um, we're probably not spending as much money on going out, drinking, unless you're drinking a lot at home, which I don't advise. Um, uh, all of the other social occasions, potentially travel you're saving money on, but think about where where you are right now, where can you make changes to your savings? Um, and then it's also thinking, what could I, what shifts could I pick up um, to get a bit of extra cash? Um, particularly in this moment, if you want to earn some extra cash short term, I know that all of the supermarkets, co-op just announced yesterday they're hiring 5,000 short term um, opportunities. So if you want to pick up a bit of extra cash and need it, there are opportunities out there for you to go and have a look at. Um, but getting really clear on your personal finances is really important. And money is um, money's a funny one and people feel really strange about this when they go freelance. But ultimately money for us is figuring out what is the story that money represents for you. So money is a story about a number. And for me, um, I might believe that money is freedom or money is security or money is whatever, but it's actually identifying what that means for you and how can you feel a bit better about what that story looks like. And um, the second thing is setting yourself up well before you leave your job. So that is getting your finances in order. It's also building out your networks. So reaching out to other organizations, to other people who are freelancing, to other industries that you want to be involved in and actually building out a bit of a network um, and making a plan. What is your plan step by step for the next three, six, 12 months that's going to help you to get set up? It's using the time that you have now to really craft what your proposition is and whatever your marketing plan is. How are you actually going to get clients? Um, if you feel like there are skill gaps in your offering, it's actually using the time to build some of the skills. As I said, if we're all going to be stuck at home for the next, I don't know, 12 weeks, it's actually a really good opportunity for us to work on some of these skills and actually get these basics in place before we do anything else. The next thing is thinking about what your working pattern is going to be like. So I think a lot of people associate freelance life with you know, just having the freedom to do this or that or the other thing. And part of that is true in that you don't necessarily have to be in an office from nine to six, um, five days a week, the kind of face time. You are dependent on yourself, holding yourself accountable, depending on the kind of work that you do. And so actually thinking about what would my routine look like? What am I doing on a Monday morning that's going to set me up properly for the week? How am I going to set in little things in the week that's going to keep me going? And um, particularly socially, because it can be, it can feel lonely or isolating if you're used to working in a team to all of a sudden working on your own. So actually thinking about what would a good working pattern look like for me? Um, and how are you going to check out at the end of the week so that you're not just drifting your work into the weekend, right? So setting those kind of bookmarks of the week for yourself, I think, is really important. Thinking about how you work best. Do you want to be in a co-working space? Do you want to be working at home? How are you going to get that set up working for you? Um, but actually thinking about that now rather than like day one, I'm a freelancer, and then you're kind of just not really sure what to do with yourself. Um, as I said, it's also about creating new networks, so tapping into new networks, things like there's a really amazing uh, Facebook group called Freelance Heroes. It's full of really great freelancers all over the place um, who share advice, share resources. It's free to join. They're really excellent. Um, we'll share a link to that a bit later and any of the things that I mentioned. Um, there's also the Escape Facebook group. There's a lot of people who are freelancing in there. Um, there's loads of different spaces for you to connect with and actually getting involved in it now is really smart. Um, the other thing is to think about what success really looks like for you. So are you freelancing in order to get freedom, time, energy, time with your family? Um, is it about money? Are you trying to build up um, some money so that you can do something else? Is it about working only on things that you want? What what actually does good look like good look like for you? And actually defining success for yourself and writing it down and putting it somewhere so that you can 
look at that every time you make a decision to take a project on or a client on or something and to know what you're actually aiming at so if for me if it's all about money and i'm trying to maximize the amount of money because i want to buy a house or i want to have a family or whatever that might be then my plan over the next 12 months is going to look radically different than if i'm going freelance in order to have a bit more space so really thinking about what that looks like is a really really important part to getting yourself set up before you leave your job um, and setting review dates for yourself constantly checking in is this working for me what's not working for me how could i do things differently how could i make this better um, and that's setting yourself up before you leave your job um, which i think is important because a lot of people just think right once i get out then i'll have a bit of space and then i'll just kind of get into it and really once you're out it can feel really um you can get really low if you haven't actually set up this stuff in advance so i would recommend use the time especially now when we all have a bit more free time to actually start working on this stuff and the third thing is to try to get a few gigs under your belt before you actually leave your job um the reason why this is important is because Often we need experience in order to get experience and just because you've had experience in a full-time job doesn't necessarily translate to being able to show that you're self-motivated, can manage yourself, are good at freelance contracts, etc. Um, so what I would suggest is getting your profile out on freelancing sites, um, things like Upwork, things like um, People Per Hour, etc. And that means that you can um, you can start to try to get some gigs before you take the leap. And um, the second thing would be to reach out to old employers for potential work. So it might be that there are people you've already worked with who would give you the opportunity for a freelance contract in the short term. Um, and then the other thing that you might want to do is to offer some pro bono work, but only if it's a genuine win-win. So this is about building up experience. If you're finding that it's a barrier for you to, to get experience without already having it, <laughs> excuse me um then often trying to take on some free projects for now can be a really good way of you getting the experience you need to be able to um to get paid contracts later but it, again it has to be a genuine win-win when people say talk about free work um we've all got different opinions about free work but for me if it's serving you in a way that you can take the testimonials or you can repurpose that work in some way or that's going to lead to something and you're really confident about that then I think it's okay but if people are just taking advantage then I think you have to be pretty clear about boundaries but um, it can be a good way to get yourself out there um, reaching out to your own network so putting out LinkedIn Facebook wherever you're hanging out online hey, I'm going into this, this is what I'm doing, does anybody need any help with this? Um, the greatest opportunities tend to be just very close to us. So if I reach out to my network and say, hey, I'm looking to help people um, design learning programs. Um, does anybody know anybody who needs a bit of help? Um, probably somebody that I know will know somebody who needs help. So actually thinking about um, those closer networks rather than trying to do the far away ones and the kind of the freelancing sites might be a better place for you to start. Um, I would suggest you try to get three or four projects or um, contracts before you leave your job just so that you have you'll firstly you'll feel a bit more confident in where you are and actually feeling like okay I can go and do this but it's also just as much about you seeing if you actually like doing it as it is um, about getting the experience because you might find that actually for you balancing loads of different things that are going on juggling your own time working on your own doesn't really work for you and it would be better for you to know that before you leave than once you've already left so I would recommend you using it as a bit of an experiment to get some experience of course maybe to make a, a bit of extra cash but also to see if you actually enjoy doing the work um, and that's a lot of information for preparing to take the leap, but hopefully that's useful. The second thing that you need to think about, um, and by the way, you can ask questions, and if I know the answers, then I will respond to them um, a little bit later. Um, but the second thing you need to do is to think about crafting your offering. So if you're going to go freelance, you obviously need to think about um, what are you actually selling to people. So figuring out what you're offering as a freelancer, building up your personal brand and getting your pricing strategy right. Now that's the second thing you need to think about. 
when you're trying to think about what you're offering as a freelancer, um, you can ask yourself all of these questions. So what do you think that you are best placed to offer to employers or clients? Um, what do you do in your current job that you already are very good at that you might be able to do part time or in short term contracts? What do you actually enjoy doing? This is a really important part. I think a lot of people think, well, I could go and freelance doing X, but if you don't really like doing X, why would you like to do it part time, maybe with more stress than full time? So you should actually enjoy what you're doing. I think that's a really good thing to think about. Um, if you're not sure what you might be able to do, just ask five friends or colleagues or people that you know what they think you're really good at. Um, because often those people can act as a mirror and really help you to, to figure that out. Um, think about the characteristics that make you who you are um, and how you want to involve that and when what your offering looks like. So I might be a digital marketer and but because um, I'm very caring and compassionate and very principled or I really care about different issues, I'm only going to be working on digital marketing for brands that are helping um, I don't know make the world better in some way and for me that's like that's my niche and I'm gonna help those specific people so it's thinking about how you're integrating who you are with what you're actually offering to people it's also thinking about what what you might want to become good at because it might be that you think okay great I'd like to become a digital marketing consultant but I'm not quite good at that yet but that's what I would really like to become excellent at um, and so you can you can use that and kind of evolve that in some of your um, your your offering. Um, there's a the guy who I don't know if anybody knows the Dilbert cartoons. I'm going to show you one in a second. But um, he gave this really amazing career advice that basically said if you want something extraordinary in your career, you have two paths. You can either become the best at one specific thing, or you can become very good. So like the top 25 percent at two or more things and I think as a freelancer you probably want to err more towards the second than the first just because in situations like the one that we're in if you are only doing one thing it leaves you a little bit vulnerable to the circumstances that are happening so how can you become very good at just a few things so that you always can be a bit more agile in your offering depending on what's going on in the world um, the next oh Oh yeah, that's the Dilbert. That's Scott Adams. He created the Dilbert cartoons. And the, what he talks about is that you can make yourself rare by combining two or more pretty goods until nobody else has your mix. So for him, he was working in a corporate job, really was interested in drawing, was writing, thinking a lot about you know silly conversations and things that happen in corporate offices. And so he created the Dilbert cartoons which have he's gone on to be hugely successful and he was just combining things that he was pretty good at or pretty knowledgeable into something that actually resonated with a lot of people so it's thinking about how you might be able to combine some of those things that's really powerful and then you want to think about your personal brand so if you google yourself like right now if you picked up your phone and you google yourself what would come up um would it be your facebook would it be your linkedin would it be I don't know, some profile from your school or university, would it be, what would it be? Um, and the reason that I say that is because you already have a personal brand, you just might not have spent very much time crafting it or thinking much about it. Um, and a personal brand, a lot of people feel like, oh, well, that's really a naff term, you know, it sounds very narcissistic and a bit self-indulgent, but the reality is that we all have one and it's all, the only thing that your personal brand is, is it's a blend of what your experience is, what you've done, what your values are, what your skills are, and it's it's the thing that differentiates you from somebody else. Um, so when you're trying to think about how to build your personal brand, it's thinking about what are your personality traits that really shine through in your work? How do people describe you? Um, what values really guide you in your work? Um, thinking like a supplier, I think this is really important. So when we have a job, we act very much like a customer. So the customer mindset of you give me a job, you give me work and then I'll go on my way. But when you're a freelancer, that's totally flipped around. You need to be thinking about, right, I'm a supplier. How can I go and provide value to these organizations, to these people? Um, and really thinking about that and having that be a really core part of your personal brand. It should all be about how you can help other people to achieve their goals rather than, okay, give me work, 
you know, I, I like doing this, I like doing that. It, it's not about what you like. Um, even if you're doing something you like, it's about how you can provide value to other people. So really think about that in your communications because it's really important. Um, and the last one of how can you be a purple cow? Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of a guy called Seth Godin. Um, he's written a book about um, being a purple cow. And the principle is if you're a train or you're driving down the road and there's a bunch of cows in all the fields, you don't really ever mention them. But if there was a purple cow, that is something you would say, hey, look at that purple cow, isn't that really interesting? And what we all should be trying to do, particularly when you are trying to stand out in a freelance marketplace, is thinking about how can I be a purple cow? How can I, what can I do? How can I behave? How can I show up? How can I offer my services in a way that people will remark upon what I'm doing? And that's what being remarkable is about. It's not like being extraordinary, it's being something that people will be talking about. Um, so thinking about that can be in all different ways of approaching things. It could be how you conduct your services. It can be how you, um, what your marketing is like. It could be in how extraordinary the work is that you do and how quality it is. It could be about your communication style. So actually really thinking about how can I be more of a purple cow um, will really serve you as you're kind of trying to build out something that differentiates you from other people. Um, and uh, we talk a lot about personal branding. These, I think, are these. These are the three C's of, of branding um, to think about. One is consistency. So your profiles, whether it's your website, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, um, whatever. If you've got a profile on the dots or wherever you might be hanging out online, do they have cohesion? Are they consistent? Do they make sense with the story that you're trying to tell about what you do? Um, that's really, really important. And the second thing is creativity. So obviously you want to be remarkable. You don't want to just have the same website, the same profile, the same bio as everybody else. So how can you stand out? What In what ways might you be remarkable and creative? And then obviously um, the last one is about credibility. So how can you showcase your experience and your skills and the networks to demonstrate credibility? Now that might be because of what you've done with your job. It might be those three projects I mentioned that you should probably get an order before you leave your job. Um, or it might be people that you're associated with, testimonials, um, evidence of work that you've done. So it's thinking about, right, when I'm putting together this personal brand, is it consistent? Is it creative? Does it, does it appear credible? And those things are all really, really important to think about. Um, and credentials only really tell part of the story, right? You can you can be perfect on paper, you can have all of the things that you need to have, but it is about personality, right? It's also about um, how you show up, it's about what you like, it's about um, showing more than that. So I think it's really important to think about how you're demonstrating all of those other things beyond just your skills, right? Um, so once you've gone through this process and you're thinking about it, just make sure that you refresh your touch points, right? Whether it's LinkedIn, social media, personal website, your CV, your portfolio. Um, and there are lots of tools that you can use for your personal brand, like whether it's, um, you know, LinkedIn is probably the most obvious one. It's like the adult professional network, um, you know, social network. Um, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube is a really great one because YouTube is, the second largest search engine in the world. So if you want to show up high on Google, having some stuff on YouTube can be really useful. Um, your own personal website and Instagram even. So it's just thinking about, you might not want to use all of those and that's totally fine, but thinking about these are different tools that you might be able to use and which ones work best for you. Um, I just wanted to go through, I guess, how you might think about your LinkedIn profile and kind of how how um, you might be able to describe the kind of transition um, from where you are to where you're going. Um, so you, I've got three ideas for you. The first one is the transition profile. So that's a mix of what you currently do and what you want to do. So it's trying to bridge your old world and your new world. And you can use the summary in your LinkedIn. You can also use your headline. I'm going to give you an example. This is Jim. He's in our team. I'm sure he's going to love being an example on here. Um, so Jim works helping all of our employers on a, at Escape, but he also is writing a book 
and he also contributes to a magazine around um, films. So he's kind of combining these two things in his thing to try to identify he's not just one thing, but actually he's he's able to do multiple things. So that's something to consider. The second thing that you might be able to do, I'm sure you've all seen people doing these things, but things to think about for yourself, and that's the kind of I help profile. So I help these type of people or organizations do this thing. Um, and that is that kind of supplier mindset that I mentioned, and that's where you can kind of get those skills in there. Um, this is mine. Here we are. Um, so mine is, it now looks different, but it says I help people build businesses and careers that matter to them and the world. And that is kind of one way of showcasing actually what you help people to do. It's easy to identify with, again. Um, the next one is the kind of slash or portfolio career. Now, if you want to have multiple things that you offer, this is a this is a good way of laying it out. Now, this could be your interests, your aspirations, but again, it's a good way of showing up and appearing in more searches for different keywords. Um, this is Matt. He is running our startup accelerator and has been working with Escape for the last five years. And for him, he is showing up as a facilitator, a consultant, a writer, a speaker on these all these different things. So for him, it's a really good way of, of profiling yourself um, in different ways. Another thing, I always use Matt's uh, LinkedIn as a good example, because what Matt wants to do more of and showcase that he's very good at is his speaking, his facilitation. And what he's done, which is clever, is obviously he has a photo of him doing a talk on his LinkedIn, so immediately I'm associating that Matt is does talks of some description. So it's if you don't have that, if you whatever your if you just have the blue thing on LinkedIn, get rid of the blue thing. Try to get a photo of you doing something that is related to what you want to be seen for, because we associate images so much faster. You know, we process it like. I don't, I've forgotten, I'm going to say the wrong stats, like 80,000 times faster, 50,000 times faster um, images than we do with words. So actually use that opportunity to really demonstrate what it is that you want people to see you as. Um, and I think it's really important if you are trying to have a freelance career to have your own website. Um, uh, because that's kind of your home base. That's where you can tell the narrative. All of these different platforms can lead back to your website. but it should you should have a website when i google you i should be able to find you and understand what you do very quickly and be able to find you in all these different ways so it is something to think about there are loads of tools for this um i always recommend card which is c a r r d dot co which is just one page uh landing pages um i think it's free unless you want to change the url which you can do and it's very cheap um, Strikingly is also very good, but these are platforms that you can actually use to make your own website. It's very, very simple, but it doesn't have to be overcomplicated, but having something that describes what you do is really important. Um, and the third part of getting your offering right is, is getting your pricing right. Um, now, it's really important to be open and transparent about pricing right from the beginning. So don't wait until people say like, um, you know, don't wait until you're just agreeing for something and then say, oh, well, by the way, it's this much money. It, you're going to have a much better relationship with people if you can communicate what your pricing is up front, because they might be assuming it's too much or it's too little and they can't afford it. And so actually just having that be a part of the conversation is really important. Um, uh, practice communicating it with people. We feel very uncomfortable asking for money, talking about money, even if it's already been agreed. But if you want to um, to justify whatever your price is to the client, you should practice like with people in the mirror, on video, whatever it is, so that you can get really comfortable with it. With it, um, know what you need to do to charge more. So if you need to charge more for something, what do you need to do? How do you need to prepare yourself? What is the kind of justifications, etc. If people say yes straight away, you're probably charging too little. Um, so it can be a good rule of thumb because you, a lot of people, times we expect a negotiation of some description. Um, when somebody asks you if you can do something, get comfortable with asking, is there a fee? Or just saying that right up front because maybe they think, 
um, you'll do it for free, but they would be willing to pay you a fee. So just getting comfortable with asking people for money for your time is really, really important and difficult. So the practice part is really important. Um, and you should always review after you've done any project, actually, was that worth um, my time for the amount of money that I got for this? And then you can tweak your pricing accordingly. Um, you can get feedback on it and just... Um, that's a really important part. Don't think, okay, well, I've said it's 200 pounds a day, and so that's what my rate is forever. And then um, actually you find out that you're spending 100 pounds on this and you're having to do this, and actually it's not accommodating for you. you it's something you have to continuously review and make sure it's really working for you. Um, there are lots of different ways of pricing. Um, it is an art, it's not a science. Um, you should be testing different things to see what works best. Um, there are three different models that you can look at, I guess, with pricing. One is cost-based, so you want to cover all of your costs plus some markup percentage. So all of your costs, that should include whatever costs you're incurring from a, you know, your internet or, I don't know, your co-working space or um, your phone, etc. But you want to cover all of your costs and then you add some percentage. There are pros and cons of all of these. The second one is market-based, so you can use what other people are charging to, to kind of benchmark yourself as the same with everybody else. Um, the best one is values-based pricing. So this is how much is actually worth to a client. So if I think, okay, well, I'm going to charge 300 pounds a day, but I'm going in and fixing a problem that is going to enable my client to make 10,000 pounds next week. Actually, my time is worth more. So it's thinking about actually how valuable is what you're doing to the client. And um, that gives you a little bit more wiggle room. And that's how you kind of get away from the market based, which is hard. The cost base is hard to kind of um, if you can get to the values base, that's that's a lot better as a pricing model. Um, it means you have to kind of think about it a bit more, but um, it's a really good way of going about it. And you can figure out how much somebody values your time and if it's worth it for you to do that. There's lots of different ways you can do it, hourly, daily, quantity, so project fees, um, output fees. You can have a package that you do. So a lot of people who do, for example, digital marketing might have um, might have a, a package of like, we'll set up your Instagram and your Facebook ads and it costs 800 pounds and then ongoing it's 500 pounds a month or whatever that might be. So depending on what the freelance skills are you're trying to do, thinking about um, what pricing structure might work well and obviously looking around at what other people are doing and then seeing what one works the best for you. Um, you might have different tiers depending on what, cli what type of client, if it's a corporate, for example, um, they might have a lot more cash and be willing to pay a bit more money, whereas if you're working with a small business, they might have a smaller budget. So actually thinking about, do I have different um, tiers of client? And actually, if I go in, if I'm charging a, a thousand pounds a day for a corporate, I'm not necessarily going to be able to do that with a small business. So also being sensible about it, because you don't want to ruin that relationship by suggesting too much or being considerate of what their means might be. And the last thing, I guess, is make sure that your branding is right for the price that you're charging. If you are trying to offer a premium service, but your branding is really budget, and I don't mean you've spent very little on your branding, don't spend money on branding. Use Canva, use um, Taylor Brands, the logo maker, use all of these tools that you can use that I mean, you don't have to spend any money, but you can have a really slick looking brand that you're using, but just make sure that it's right for the price. Because if you have a premium thing and your website looks really shoddy, people are probably not gonna be willing to pay if they're looking into it, right? So it's just making sure that everything is consistent and makes sense for the price that you're trying to charge. Um, if you're trying to figure out your basic and your you know hourly rate, there's lots of ways of doing it, but a very rough, um, calculation for you to personalize is your annual salary or an annual salary you're looking to make plus your expenses plus the profit that you would like to make then divide that by how many billable working hours you can have and remember that not every hour of your day is going to be spent working on a client so you're going to have days of admin you're going to have days where you're just marketing yourself where you're kind of hustling for work so make sure that you um, account for that and then 
you'll get somewhere around what your basic hourly rate is. There's also the salary calculator online that you can figure out more or less, but remember that that deducts national insurance, et cetera, from it. So you'd want to go from the top. Um, there's lots of ways of doing it, but this is just some rough ideas for you guys to get started. One thing that I want to warn people about is to avoid the race to the bottom. So if you go on to, this is from Upwork, um, if you go on to some of the freelancing platforms, you'll see that if you type in, so I put in project management or a virtual assistant or something into Upwork, and what came up is a whole load of people who are qualified to do the work and really the only differentiating, look, their job success is 100%. They all have similar skills that I can see. The only differentiation is price. And if your only differentiator is your price, you're always going to be undercut by somebody. I mean, look, you've got people making who are charging $35 an hour and then somebody who's charging $12 an hour. So you don't want price to be your only differentiator. So think about, um, just keep that in mind. Try, you don't want to necessarily be the cheapest, especially if it's at coming at a cost to you. And that's why getting all the other bits right is so important. Um, the third thing is thinking about how do you build out your portfolio. So um, three parts of that. So one is balancing your projects out. The second is considering your approach to clients. And the third is constantly reassessing to make sure that it's all working for you. Um, when People think about freelancing, often people think it's very risky and I, I will put my hands up and admit that in this moment that we're in, freelancers, as I said, are the ones that are getting really, um, I don't know if I can say this on camera, but so anyway, um, freelancers are the ones who are really getting screwed by the system because they don't have the same um, safety nets, which I think is totally backwards as everybody else. But the other side of freelancing is that it can be flexible and it can be opportunity rich and it can let you shift gears when the world changes. So right now, there are brands who really need short term work, who need project work. So a lot of a lot of businesses are really struggling. But you look at the people like um, uh, the Deliveroo's of the world, the the Gusto's, the Hello Freshes, the um, the tech, you know, this kind of SaaS products, Zoom, my God, are going through the roof. All of these businesses need people right now. And actually, if you are freelancing, it does allow you to shift and it allows you to shift your skill set to offer to new brands if things are changing. So if people are no longer um, needing something in person and you're an expert in online facilitation, then now all of a sudden you've got a lot of people who need your help. So it does allow you that kind of ability. Um, there's a really, some of it's really great, some of it is is maybe less great, but there's a book called The Freelancer's Bible, which is really, I have found a lot of really useful stuff in there. And what one thing that they talk about is that you should treat your, your project portfolio as you would an investment portfolio. And I'm not an investor, so this is all very foreign language to me. But um, when you're thinking about financial investments, you try you typically have four different levels of an investment portfolio so i'm going to go through them um what you want to do is you want to try to balance for three goals so the first one is you want to obviously have enough clients of the right kind um you want to make sure that you have not too few not more than you can manage people who can pay you well and who can help you to advance your career and what you're trying to do the second thing is you need to obviously bring in enough steady income um to reduce the kind of cash flow highs and lows that you have as a freelancer inevitably so you want to kind of make sure that that's steady and then obviously you need to try to meet your income goals so it is a balance it's not a, an exact equation it's figuring out what works for you depending on what your circumstances is um your circumstances are rather um but these are three things for you to think about um so the first level of a, a good portfolio is the blue chips and this, is, this should kind of be the core of your freelance portfolio. Now, these are things that are more long-term. So maybe it's two days a week, three days a week, uh, one day a week, but for a longer-term contract. It might be a three-month contract. It might be something else. But these are things that um, are, are basically longer-term projects that you can work on. And these are income anchors for you. 
they can allow you to build really rich relationships with the, the clients that you're working with because it's more than just a one-off and they're really good opportunities for referrals. So this should be where you have put a lot of your energy into trying to build. Now, obviously, um, the problem is that you can feel like you're really part of a team, but ultimately if their system shifts or if something changes, that might not work. So don't be overly reliant on it. It's making sure that you have a few of these things at one time rather than just one and thinking that's always going to be there. Um, the other challenge is that sometimes you can have a great project, but an awful team. Um, and sometimes you can have great people in an awful project. So it's just going to be a balance to figure out what works for you. Um, you should always have more than one. You should always have this kind of level one simmering, so potentials that you're kind of planting seeds for um, elsewhere. But it's really important to maintain boundaries. And I know that there are freelancers who work with us, who we consider to be part of the escape family. Um, but ultimately, they're not working full time and they have to uphold their boundaries and say, hey, Sky, like, I'm working Tuesday and Thursday this week. And so, you know, they're not available to be, um, they're not available to be available outside of those hours. So upholding those boundaries is really important. And it's, it's all about having a conversation with your employer and just saying, hey, you know, this is when I can be available to you. If you need extra time, let's have a conversation, et cetera, et cetera. But it is really important. So this is the first level. Um, the second one are kind of growth investments. So this might be, um, this might be opportunities that maybe aren't things that you want to do long term, but are really good opportunities for you to make some cash right now. So the benefits of these things are, you know, you're in control of choosing them. They can be profitable opportunities. So maybe it's working with a corporate or I don't know, somebody who's maybe not the most exciting brand, but actually it's a good growth opportunity for you. Um, obviously, juggling, as with anything, is difficult, managing time. Um, when you're trying to get these opportunities, you have to price to compete. So, for example, corporates, they are going to be going out and looking at agencies, etc. So you do have to be competitive in your pricing and um, you've got to be persistent, but be selective. Again, it should work for you. It shouldn't be sacrificing and working with terrible people because you need to make some money. So you need to balance all of these things. Um, the third one is kind of one shots and long shots. Now, this is things like Upwork or um, uh, people per hour or any of these things. Hold on, just give me one second. The joy is working from home. Somebody's hoovering upstairs, so that's fun. Um, so the one shots and the long shots, these are the things like the freelancing platforms that I mentioned with avoiding the race to the bottom. Um, the benefits of this is obviously you're not having to do any networking, you don't have to do any cold calls, it's very easy to apply, it's easy to put yourself out there. It might lead to blue chips, so for example there's a guy who we work with all the time um, that we found through Upwork and we have been working with him, he helps us with our website, we have been working with him for um, three years on and off. So. Sometimes it can lead to longer term, um, so you have to keep that in mind, it is possible, but don't spend too much time on these freelancer platforms because often um, the ones that are like a supermarket, it can be very, very difficult to stand out. Um, it feels a bit like an audition and you are always tempted to drop your pricing, so it's just something to be conscious of. Um, you should see them as short term, limit the, the amount of time that you spend going on there, the focus, Look for the three P's, which are price, um, projects, and people. So is the price right? Is the project interesting for you? And are you going to be working with people you really want to work with? Remember, if you're going into freelancing, it should be because it's it's improving your life and career somehow, not making it worse. So you still want to think about these things for yourself. Um, and then the fourth level is kind of the new ventures and growth. So those are the most exciting, the kind of projects that you really want to get to, but are going to take a bit more time. It could be organizations you'd love to work with, um, projects that you kind of have in the pipeline and hustle. And these things are really great, but don't spend too much time on it. You've got to balance it. As I said, it's about balancing your portfolio out. Treat yourself like a client, like put deadlines in place, break it down, set a schedule, um, and manage it like a project that you might, so it might be that I'm coming up with a project to 
um, rebuild escapes website or I don't know I want to start a new freelancer program at escape for example I need to project manage it you know come up with something and then take it to escape to try um, but these are things you should be working on in the background when you have some space but just thinking about how to balance those things um, fourth thing I feel like I'm talking a lot but I guess that's what happens when you're talking to yourself on the internet I will look at questions after we go through these these next two um, this is the very important part which is all about managing your finances now luckily in our team someone who is a freelancer who we work with who is wonderful is somebody called Stacy Lohman she has a business called Pakira money and um, she has lent us some of her <clears throat> advice on how to manage your money really well as a freelancer um, she's a money coach she helps people with this all the time so um, when you are a freelancer you do have a different relationship with money it is different um, it's very important to remember why you're doing it setting some principles for yourself around money so you know how much do you need why are you doing it what's going on um, for you but keeping everything to do with your finances as simple and intentional as possible um, and reviewing things all the time as we mentioned now <clears throat> this is really good advice that Stacey gives to commit to regular sessions to review your finances because it's very easy to bury your head in the sand and kind of avoid it I think we all like to we'd all rather not know most of the time but don't skip it. You always should know where you're at. It's a really good way of making yourself not feel anxious and kind of get into the, the kind of freelancer fatigue that sometimes people can fall into. Um, it does require a lot of empathy, you know, freelancing. You need to get used to talking about money with your clients, um, with your other, with other freelancers, with support networks, with yourself, um, because um, it's something that you're going to have to be talking about. Um, good personal finance habits you should have. Think about for free work, what are you willing to do? What are you not willing to do? Um, again, for me, it's all about, um, is it a genuine win-win? And being really clear about the boundaries of that thing so that it doesn't just kind of cascade into a big project that you then feel really hard done by about. Um, so it's gotta be a win-win, but really set those principles up front of like, this is what I'm gonna say yes to, and this is what I'm gonna say no to. And so when those opportunities come to you, you have already decided how you're gonna respond in some way. Um, <clears throat> Stacey has created a really excellent checklist of um, things for you to think about and prioritize and work through as you are trying to um, create your own financial well-being as a freelancer. So it's thinking about clients and getting paid, managing your business, and then your own money. Um, and um, these things, most people don't think about these things until it's too late, but actually setting yourself up right from the beginning is really important. So um, things around invoices, how are you gonna communicate it? When you've done a job, is it worth it to you? Are you setting up a pension? Like thinking about these things might seem um, for some people very uncomfortable but it is going to be more and more important because nobody else is going to be setting those things up for you in this moment so here's a checklist of things for you to think about again I'm going to share these slides later so you can go through each of them and see what's right for you um, bank accounts I would highly recommend at least having a separate bank um, bank account or you know like a separate pot for your money that you make as a, as a freelancer there are lots and lots of different um, bank accounts that you can do as you can see all of these ones are are the kind of business bank accounts they're all online um, but you should always have a separate account from your personal one now I can say this from experience when I used to do freelancing I set I was not very good at doing that and then I started it and I ended up getting a bill from HMRC and needing to like suddenly find about three grand um, which was really painful and I had to pay it off over time etc so keep it separate from the beginning um, rather than trying to do it later um, you should be trying to pay yourself consistently so if you are getting income it's not just saying oh, okay I've got all of this money all of a sudden try to try try to pay yourself a monthly salary if you can um, 
as money is coming in, you have it in your separate account. Again, transfer that over to your personal account so that you're getting some consistent income every month. Um, you should be uh, saving between 25% and 30% of your income for tax. Figure out what that number actually is and please save it because, as I said, it's really unpleasant to get a bill that you're not prepared to pay from HMRC. Um, they can be flexible with it, uh, particularly now, I think they'll be very flexible about it, but it's still something you want to prepare for from the beginning. Um, there is a lot of uh, free accounting software that you can get. So when I was freelancing, I used to use uh, QuickBooks, which was great for me because it was £1.99 a month and it connected automatically to my bank. And what you can do is you can go through in QuickBooks and tag if something is a personal expense or a business expense, and it will actually automatically calculate how much you, how much of the things that you're spending can be classed as an expense. So something like that might save you a lot in the long run. If you're not using an accountant, you might want to consider it. But again, um, it's using it when you need it. Not necess You don't necessarily need that from the beginning, but you see how you get on in the, the quantity of transactions that are happening and, and how you're able to manage it, but it might make it easier for you. Um, Coconut is a, is a new bank that is just for self-employed people and freelancers. Um, I've not, I've heard really good things about them, but I've not used them. Monzo has a business bank account that they're coming out with. I know people who use all of these accounts. Um, so it's just seeing what one might work right for you. But do check for hidden fees and penalties and charges because some bank accounts, most of these will not charge you unless you want some sort of pro features. But just check, it's really important because you don't want an extra expense that you weren't expecting. Um, Things around taxes and NI and VAT. So if you are going to become a freelancer, you need to register with HMRC as a self-employed person. Now you can be both self-employed and employed at the same time. That's totally fine from a tax perspective, unless you are on a tier two visa, in which case don't do that um, as I'm on a tier two visa. You're not allowed to be self-employed on that visa, but you should already know that. But otherwise, if you're here and in the UK and you don't have to be on that kind of visa, um, then you can be employed and self-employed at the same time. Um, you can earn a thousand pounds or less than a thousand pounds through um, self. Uh, if you yes, through self-employment, then you don't need to declare it. So you can earn up to a thousand pounds without declaring it, but above a thousand pounds through self-employment, you need to complete a tax return, um, but you might not necessarily have to pay tax on it, but you will need, as soon as you register as self-employed every year, regardless of whether you're making any money or not, you'll have to complete a tax return. So only register as self-employed once you know that you're going to be making more than a thousand pounds in the year otherwise you're just adding more life admin which i don't think anybody needs any more life admin um the tax year is the 6th of april to the 5th of april um january 31st is when you have to have completed your tax buy um again i got totally um, messed about with that so be um be mindful about it put in your diary don't do it at the last minute because the website can crash on the last day because everybody's doing it at the last minute as we tend to all do but things for you to think about what the tax rates are, depending on what your financial circumstances are. Um, something about money that is one of my favorite quotes in the whole world is, when you're thinking about money, of course, your relationship with money will change when you're a freelancer than it is when you are working full time, naturally, because it's, um, it's coming in in different ways. But I like to think about money like this. It's it's like gasoline during a road trip. You don't want to run out of gas on your trip, but you're not doing a trip of gas stations, like, like a tour of gas stations. And for me, I think that's really, <laughs> it's like my favorite thing. Don't be too obsessed with the money. You need enough money to keep going, but also money in your life. You're not just trying to go from money to money to money. It's about what money provides for you. So. Don't panic about it. Think about what you actually need, not, not maybe matching what you're on in your full-time job because maybe that's not what you need. Maybe you're spending a lot of money um, at the weekends because you hate your job or 
you're you're not going to have to travel from Brighton to London or wherever, and so therefore you're saving 400 pounds a month in travel costs. So actually think about what you need, and then how can you use it like gasoline on a road trip, um, and not kind of falling into that trap of oh money 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 I've just got to get more money, and it's really just being conscious about it. Um, and the last thing of five things, and then we're going to be just about out of time, is keeping yourself sane. Um, because freelancing can be really rewarding. It can also be stressful, um, depending on your circumstance. As I said, I'm sure anybody who's a freelancer right now, depending on what you do, is probably feeling the squeeze at the moment. Um, so here's some advice for keeping yourself sane. Um, again, this is Stacy has um, Stacy from Procure came up with these. This is about beware the emotional tax of freelancing. So the kind of fear that money will dry up saying yes to everything don't say yes to everything you know this is about being aware of all of these things that can happen um and looking after yourself right so all of these things are normal um there is a lot of they're trying to do a lot of legislation around late payment of invoices um people feeling guilty if they say no to free work uh compromising so that you're not upsetting your client these are all things to just be aware of and it's kind of the, the fatigue that people get being a freelancer if you're in this position so it's just being aware that those things come up and saying right i'm not going to let these fears take over or finding ways of coping with them that's the main thing because they will come up inevitably at some stage um i really love this this is like the real journey of doing something on your own um is you get really excited at the beginning you're like oh this is really great let's let's do it let's go for it and then it's hard and then it's like up and down and up and down and up and down and this is just the reality of the journey whether you're starting your own business whether you're going freelance um this is just the reality of what the journey looks like and so what you need to figure out how um what you need to figure out for yourself is how do you optimize when the times are good and that could be financially putting more money away it could be um, if you've got more free time, using that time to really take care of yourself, go on holiday, like give yourself the space. So how do you optimize the times when it's good? And how do you endure the times when it's difficult? And knowing that, of course, it's going to be up and down over time, for me, just makes me feel better, knowing that it won't last forever. It's not necessarily everything. And I can get through it because there's going to be an up or a down coming at some stage. But how can you optimize the good times and how can you endure the difficult times? Um, and part of that is about enduring the war with self-doubt because we all have it, especially if we are freelancing. Um, so this is, I really like this. Um, it's all about allowing yourself to feel the fear and, um, and pushing ourselves and, and understanding that when we feel fear, we let ourselves have it, we often, we get a greater capacity to hold that, um, which is just going to be a normal part. A practice that I really like doing, um, which sounds uh, maybe weird, is like a hobby that you like doing, is something called fear setting. And uh, Tim Ferriss has an amazing TED talk about this. And this is how it works. Basically, you write down the worst case scenario, um, get really specific, define all of your worst nightmares, and then how would you prevent that? So like very specifically, if all of my clients canceled their, um, my work for the next three months, what specifically could I do um, to reduce the likelihood of that happening? So something that somebody did, which I think is very clever, is um, uh, somebody was in touch with this person who was a who was um, a freelancer and said we you know we have to pause as of April because of our financial situation uh, because of coronavirus, um, but hopefully we can pick it up again at some stage. And this person very very smartly said. Um, uh, well, why don't we continue working together? And if at the end of it, you feel like you can pay me for the time, then that would be great. But if not, then no hard feelings, because for them, it was very low risk apart from time. Um, but actually, for from a receiving perspective, that is 
um, the person was very grateful, but also that could help that person to be in uh, employment for a little bit longer and they might get money when the business has a bit more cash. So I don't know if I've explained that properly, but it's thinking about what are creative ways that you might be able to approach this really bad thing happening. So whether it's saying, okay, you know, why don't we keep working together? And then at the end of all of this chaos, if you feel like you're able to pay me for the time that I've done, um, you have to be really okay with them not paying you, by the way. That's very important. But um, they're probably not going to take the piss. Um, so something like that, or is there ways that you could cut cost, or is there an alternative skill set you might be able to do? Could you pivot your offering? So it's thinking about how you could prevent it. And then if the worst case scenario does happen, what would you do to get back on track? But I find this kind of fear setting um, exercise really useful, regardless of what situation you're in, just to figure out, okay, I always have a plan if the worst case happens. And it just means that everything's a little bit less stressful as a base level, because you always have some sort of plan or intention. Um, the other thing that you can do is to think about how you raise your waterline of resilience. So um, there's this guy called Chris Johnson who works with the School of Life and he came up with this idea of a waterline of resilience and that's kind of this idea that we um, have waterline, so if we are, we can either raise or get our waterline based on what we do and that determines how resilient we are. So, the way that you think about this is you think, well, I feel worse about losing all my clients if, and then there's probably a whole load of things um, that you might be able to do. So like if I wasn't getting enough sleep, if I wasn't getting exercise, etc. cetera. Um, and that's how you know things that you need to do less of. And then what are the things that would raise your waterline? So I would feel better about losing all my clients if, um, you know, I was getting enough sleep, I was getting exercise, I was eating properly, I was spending time with supportive people, and actually thinking about how you can you can raise it to keep the high, making space for the things that might seem self-indulgent, allow you to keep going, so that's very important. Um, and resilience is a muscle, right? So you build it over time, it comes from taking on projects, it comes from doing things that are difficult, and you get better at it over time. So. Um, practice some of these things, look after yourself, think about how you can keep your energy up. It's very, very important um, to do that. So think about how you can do that. Take on little projects so that you can test out and build up your resilience. Um, and, and it will really help you. It's more important as a freelancer than it is just working as an employee. So it's something to really spend some time thinking about. Um, so that is the end of the time. I've talked for a really long time. Um, so I apologize for talking for so long. I hope that that was really was useful for you guys. Um, we are running a two and a half hour uh, online workshop on the 25th of April. It's paid, but it's going to be an intensive interactive workshop to kind of set up freelance career, kind of going into a bit more depth and exercises on some of the stuff that we talked about. If you have other questions about um, building a freelance career, get in touch with us um, on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or um, at school at escapethecity.org and we will probably be following this up writing a blog about some of the advice so I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have and yeah I hope that you've enjoyed it and um, yeah thanks so much for joining. Um, now I just have to figure out how to turn it off. <laughs>